Um, hi, good evening. Um, my name is Mark Jackson. I'm just going to talk uh, this evening on the anterior cruciate ligament injury and uh, a brief overview really of uh, the reconstruction um, that we as surgeons often tend to offer. So yeah, just as a way of an introduction, my name is Mark Jackson. I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon based here predominantly in the sports surgery clinic in Santry and um, I'm solely really now a knee specialist. So I get to see patients uh, with their injuries and problems really from the ages of 12 and upwards. And patients come from pretty much the whole country and uh, are referred in from their general practitioners, their physiotherapists, sports therapists, other surgeons, A&E departments, um, and other sources too. So my work is split. 50% um, of the work I do is predominantly sports and what we call soft tissue injuries, which incorporates the anterior cruciate ligament injury. So the top three pictures here are with a camera in the knee, and that's just looking at cartridge type problems. The bottom right picture and middle picture here uh, are actually a cruciate ligament tear. So this is a torn cruciate ligament with my probe on it. And this is after we've cleaned it out and put a new cruciate ligament in place. And the bottom left picture is a more uh, complicated reconstruction of many ligaments in the knee, such that sometimes we rarely, you know, unfortunately, we sometimes see with uh, um, knee dislocations. Then the other half of the work is more degenerative in nature, uh, which means osteoarthritis. And that can involve offering patients procedures such as half or partial knee replacements, uh, a full knee replacement, such as in the bottom left, more complex revision or complex primary total knee replacement as on the bottom right picture, and other procedures such as uh, this, uh, operation called an osteotomy. So today, um, with the coverage of uh, anterior crucial ligament injury, this is actually a very, very big topic. And it's heavily researched over decades and still, I guess, incompletely understood. But we are getting better at what we're, what we're able to offer people with this injury. I'll try to keep it simple and not too surgical. Um, and uh, we'll just go through some of the main points, such as what is the anterior cruciate ligament? How is it uh, injured in most individuals? What options are we able to offer and discuss with uh, our patients? And also talk about some of the consequences of this injury. So what is the ACL or anterior cruciate ligament? Well, as you can see on this schematic picture on the right-hand side, this is looking at a right knee from the front and uh, the anterior cruciate ligament here spans the joint in the middle. So there are actually two cruciate ligaments, cruciate meaning crossing. So the posterior or PCL ligament is tucked in behind with the ACL here in the front. The other two ligaments are the ones around the sides that we call the collateral ligaments. So the medial, or on this picture, it's called the tibial collateral ligament, or what we often call the MCL, and on the outside, the LCL. And these pictures, which are uh, from cadaveric, speci cadaveric specimens, and um, the right-hand picture will be looking at the front-on view of a flexed left knee, so the femur being the thigh bone. Here in the middle of the knee, we can see these two ligaments, and uh, this is the ACL, joining the two bones, as we said, together. In most individuals, this will be in the region of about three centimetres long, perhaps about eight, ten 11 millimeters in diameter. And it is shaped a bit like a ribbon. And this picture on the left shows that nicely, again, coming across the joint from the tibia or the shin bone below across to attach in a pretty broad way on the back of the fibre and the femur. And this is now a side view of the knee with um, essentially the joint cut in half. So what does it actually do? Well, it is an important primary stabilizer of the knee, and that's the role of a ligament. It's to stabilize the joint. A good way to think of it is as a guardian of other structures too in the joint, and in particular, the important meniscal cartilages, which are the big cushions and shock absorbers inside the joint. And in rotation, it becomes particularly important, such as you might see Lionel Messi doing in a typical pivot and turn maneuver. And if it's torn, it means You've now got a, an ACL deficient knee and that individual will often lack confident in these kind of movements. 
So it's a fairly small ligament with a big job to do. Um, and in humans, it hasn't necessarily really involved, so evolved um, for the demands that we put it through. So if you compare our cruciate ligament to an animal such as a mountain goat, you'll find that actually the mountain goat is a far better, bigger, thicker ligament than, than we do because of how it's evolved. So how do we injure it? Well, anybody can injure their cruciate ligaments. So an elite athlete, Virgil van Dijk, can injure his knee if it's uh, wrecked by a pretty psychopathic goalkeeper like Jordan Pickford coming through on him. Um, but we also see it in you know, weekend warriors. And there are certainly high risk groups, which we'll touch upon later on um, in the discussion. It usually occurs in a competitive as opposed to a uh, training environment. And frequently it's a rapid turn, a push off and twist, maybe an awkward landing, landing on one leg, off balance, a deceleration or hyperextension. Sometimes it can be really quite innocuous and people can't believe the damage they've done um, in such a simple maneuver, um, movement. Most commonly, as we'll also mention, it doesn't involve a heavy contact or collision. So the picture in the middle here demonstrates the, the position of a knee often when it's torn with the foot flat and twisted out. The knee falls into a position that we often call valgus, with it buckling down and in on itself. And at the same time, the hip is what we call abducted, which is taken away from the side. The trunk and the center of mass is often also tilted out of position. Um, a schematic little di uh, picture like this demonstrates the twist, the red ligament in the middle of the knee being injured as the knee falls into that position. And likewise, the picture on the right, with that foot planted and twisted out, that movement happens and the ligament snaps. So in this sequence of pictures, it demonstrates someone tearing their cruciate. So this, uh, I think it's a Roma player uh, injuring his left knee. There is a little bit of what we call indirect contact. So he's taking a challenge. Then the left foot gets planted here and he's off balance with a little bit of light contact, pushing his mass out of position. So he's at what we call an at-risk position. And you can see here the knee buckling and tearing the cruciate ligament. Another example here, which is completely without contact, which is a very, perhaps the commonest uh, mechanism that we see. So this yellow um, kitted individual player number six um, is planting his left foot and he is being deceived. The player has kicked the ball out to the side, which he wasn't anticipating. The left foot gets planted, the knee buckles in and um, um, the cruciate ligament tears. These sequences show a little bit more contact. And on the left side, again, it's the yellow kitted player and it's his left knee that gets injured. He's suddenly having to change direction very quickly to react to his opponent. The left foot gets planted. He puts his right foot out and the left knee is in a vulnerable position with the foot way outside the center of his mass and the knee falls into valgus. And just like in that skeleton picture earlier, and tearing his cruciate ligament. And this sequence on the right is a bit more contact. And on this individual, number eight, it's his left knee. Again, the leg is planted, contact comes on this occasion, forcing it into that bad position and the cruciate ligament is tearing. These are video clips. Uh, so this top right picture is Joe Cole, just highlighting very clearly the mechanism we've just been discussing. The right foot gets planted, the knee buckles in and out of position. Similarly, on the bottom left, a basketball player, there is no contact, but he is reacting to his opponents. The left leg goes down and he immediately um, recognizes his, uh, he's got a problem. Bottom right is a bit different. This is contact um, and anything can happen. So it's not just the ACL. Sometimes it's torn in these kind of collisions. And although our talk today is purely about the ACL injury, um, it's not uncommon, probably in at least half of individuals, to have something else going on from a collateral ligament or a meniscal cartilage damage or bone injury. And in the top left, it's Conor McGregor tearing his own cruciate ligament. Happens at around the 18 second mark. His foot is caught in a, in a hold. He tries to pull it out himself and manages to tear his cruciate ligament. So what does the individual then typically say? Well, usually the history is of a sensation that the knee popped, the knee buckled, the knee went in and out of place. And generally there's an immediate issue. 
severe pain, patient collapsed on the ground, often then having to be helped up and off the pitch. Sometimes it's a fairly innocuous thing and people feel they might want to try and continue and they get to the sideline and don't feel too bad. But usually then they try to run again and immediately recognize that this isn't a, going to work out. Generally over 24, 48 hours, the knee looks quite swollen. There's pain on weight bearing, the patient is limping, we may even need crutches for a couple of weeks while things start to settle down. The knee then can actually start to settle and feel pretty good again in day-to-day -day life fairly quickly over that first week or two. But by then the patient has usually sought some advice via their club physiotherapist, maybe going to A&E for an assessment or visiting their GP. And the initial examination in my you know, experience can sometimes be difficult if the patient is swollen and sore and guards. So an MRI scan is generally indicated. So most individuals with a history of, that we've outlined there should uh, really have a, an urgent or semi-urgent MRI scan. Some patients uh, are told that their knee is too swollen to scan or we wait until the swelling goes down. I don't think that's usually necessary and I think you should just crack on and get the scan as soon as possible. So what does it look like on a scan? Well, the, the left hand picture here shows a very clear black ribbon structure crossing the joint, joining as we saw in the pictures earlier, the femur down onto the tibia. And the middle picture shows um, a ligament that's torn. There is no structure here. You can perhaps see the beginnings of it, but it doesn't continue and extend across the joint. And this picture on the right again shows it in a different uh, a sequence on an MRI scan showing these black uh, lines being the, the ligament that's torn and ripped off the bone and losing their tension. So that would be again features of a complete ACL tear. And an MRI scan is a very accurate way to discern this injury. How common is it? Well it is actually quite common and probably the commonest uh, significant knee injury that we see. Um, it's very difficult to get good incidence data um, in Ireland and in the UK, but inferring from other big studies um, and epidemiological investigations around the world, you could equate it to about 4,000 ACL injuries across Ireland per year. Um, but obviously that is going to be in a specific age group, with the majority occurring between the ages of 12 and 35. And this study um, is interesting looking at high school athletes in America and gives us again a good idea of how common this injury might be. So if you, they looked at 10 studies that had assessed high school um, adolescent male and females involved just in sport through their schools and local clubs, not in elite activities. And they found if you follow an average adolescent sporting female through the course of a year, who may go from their soccer season into their basketball and lacrosse season, and that's training and playing, they accrue an annual risk of an ACL injury of about two and a half percent, which is obviously clearly quite high. And this risk is a bit higher in females than males by an order of about 1.6. Um, and there are seemingly some reasons for that, but we won't go into that too much today. Um, there is, uh, Again, a difference between looking at an adolescent uh, amateur athlete and comparing that to somebody who's involved in very high level elite sport. And actually the relative risk of an elite, say premiership footballer tearing their cruciate ligament is actually relatively low. Um, and this study looked at um, 28 teams in elite European soccer, so Premier League, Bundesliga, Liga, et cetera. And really the risk is quite low. So a standard male squad would probably only get one ACL injury every couple of years. Um, so that's clearly going to be quite different to um, an amateur um, teenage type individual. And these individuals are clearly special, they're self-selected, they're robust, they're strong, they have anatomical maybe um, benefits and are probably involved in injury prevention type programs. In the clinic here, we have a registry which we put most of our ACLs into so we can look at the data and follow up results. Um, we found that the mean age, um, and this is at least, we've probably got at least, um, I think it's about 6,000 individuals now on that registry, um, but a mean age of about 25. Um, um, but importantly to recognize here in the red circled group, at least a third of our individuals are actually under the age of 20. 
we do operate and see more males than females, but that just reflects that uh, males are more intensely involved in sports, generally in terms of numbers than females. Again, talking about um, the mechanism of injury, as we've already mentioned, the non-contact injury is far more common than contact, and most of these injuries are occurring in competition as opposed to training. Um, the distribution in sports in Ireland is fairly unique compared to some other countries because of the amount of contact and field sport that is played. So at least 80% of our injuries are occurring um, in field sport, with the highest number being Gaelic football, second highest number being um, soccer, followed then by rugby and hurling. Other ones, then a minority, snow sports, um, just simple accidents, etc. So it's clearly a problem, um, particularly because this tends to be uh, an issue of young and very physically active individuals with high demands who want to get back into sports. It can be quite debilitating and life-changing for people. Um, and it does have the potential also, which we'll touch upon now, for some long-term consequences. We have a lot of high-risk sports in Ireland and not everyone is the same. So we do have vulnerable risk groups and you can't necessarily equate an average weekend warrior who is 16, 17 to an elite uh, high level um, sports person. So you've seen somebody and maybe come to see somebody then like myself in ACL is torn, what happens next? Well, we'll discuss the options and it's a responsibility then really to advise and uh, give that individual a perspective on this injury, not just from the short term, but also the long term too. In the short term, what we're going to be trying to do to that um, knee is restore confidence and allow them to hopefully get back to their sports and activities with no instability. In the long term, though, we do just need to counsel about the potential still for problems down the line. So there are three main stakeholders here with this injury. Obviously, the primary one being the patient. And in my experience, most individuals really just want a few things um, clear in their mind. They ask me, can you fix it? When are you going to fix it? Um, they ask me how long I'm going to be out for. And that's pretty much all most individuals are going to be interested in. A physiotherapist, though, will be very important. They're going to have to have appropriate uh, rehabilitation pathways in place. They're going to be able to give guidance as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate at various stages of the rehabilitation and guide that individual along the way, hopefully to a successful outcome. And the surgeon clearly needs to make the diagnosis, have a uh, a good ability to interpret what we're seeing on the scan and when we examine that patient. We need to talk about what surgery may suit that individual and have a good reliable procedure to get the best possible outcome. And the problem with an ACL that's torn, as we've mentioned, is the knee gives way. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the ability to regenerate itself like some other ligaments might, and it doesn't have the ability really to heal. So that person usually reports um, a sensation of instability, not necessarily any pain or stiffness. The majority of patients that I see clearly are going to want to resume their activities and we start thinking about options, particularly surgery. But some individuals don't have sporting goals, but they still need a robust, stable knee for their job, such as a guard or people in the military, people with construction type works and manual labour, farmers. Um, so even if they don't want to go back to sport, we'll often then still talk about the, the role of surgery. This video, if it works here, just demonstrates that instability on somebody under the anaesthetic just before they're about to have their cruise ship done. So this is a maneuver called the pivot shift. What we're doing is we're trying to reproduce the motion that happens. So as the knee is bent, it kind of clicking, you'll feel it gliding in and out of place. Um, and that's an indication that the knee is unstable, as is this test, which just turns the, um, the cruise ship ligament front to back. So is an operation always necessary? No. So non-operative treatment can be reasonable to offer in certain scenarios. That might be someone with lower demand, somebody who's a little bit older. Um, so for example, if I tore my cruise ship in my mid forties, I don't play contact sport or football anymore. I'd probably see how I went with a good rehab program first, strengthening for three to six months, and only then undergo the surgery if I failed that. If I was in my 20s and 30s or teens, I'd just get on a thing and get the surgery done as soon as possible. Um, some individuals are not in a position where they can commit to the time out and the rehabilitation. 
And that procedure then can be safely postponed and delayed as long as they commit to um, a bit of gym work and to take on board some of the do's and the don'ts. If you do go down the route though of non-operative uh, non treatment, um, some studies have been done on this and demonstrate that at five years, even with rehabilitation, at least half of the individuals have elected to cross over and get their ACL reconstructed. But these are very difficult studies to do um, because it's very difficult to get a set of, you know, a thousand um, young sporty people who've torn their ACL and split them in two according to who's going to get their crucial ligament operated on and who doesn't. Um, but it's as good as it gets here, this study. And it does demonstrate really that um, there's a very high level of failure um, and most individuals will end up electing to get a, a crucial ligament procedure. There are also much higher cartilage tears um, and interventions for cartilage tears over that period of time by a factor of about 13. So in the majority of young individuals wanting to return to sport, I'll talk to them about an ACL reconstruction because the return to sport rates are good um, and most individuals will get the outcome we want. So these two pictures here, uh, arthroscopic pictures showing what a knee looks like when I first put the camera in. There is no cruciate ligament attaching the bone here below to the bone above. And then this is a picture when we put the graft in place. So this uh, is the ACL reconstruction. So how do we do it? Well, we harvest uh, something called a graft. And there are two main options that I will discuss with patients, although predominantly I use this graft um, called the patella tendon. So we harvest a bit of tendon from the front of the knee to, to, to get a new ligament that we can then feed into the joint. These are hamstring tendons, that's the alternative. And again, we construct them, stitch them together to make a construct like this that can again be fed into the joint um, and hopefully then become a new ligament. So just in a nutshell, I'm not gonna go into this in any real detail, um, but what we then do is clean out the old cruciate. We drill tunnels up into the bone and that graft that we've already harvested, we then have to pull up and pass into the joint. What we're then hoping is the graft takes on board the role of the original ACL and heals, but this is a slow process that can't be sped up. And this is a biological um, healing time. Um, and even in the best case scenario, the whole thing takes a minimum of nine to 12 months to try and get the best results. So that's how, you'll, how long you'll tend to see a premiership footballer out. And that's how long um, your average Joe is gonna be out for as well. And there's a lot of hard work to do in the gym while all this healing is going. So this brief video here, just skip it a little bit, just shows me pulling up a tendon graft into the joint, into the tunnels. So this is the pulling sutures. The graft is gonna come up from the tibial tunnel that I've drilled down below. So these are the things coming in. This is the device we use called a button to fix it in place. And this is actually a hamstring graft. So you'll see it now suddenly pulling up as I pull up into the joint. So this is the graft itself being fed up into the joint and we're pulling it into that tunnel we've drilled. So this is so I know how far to pull it in and that's now the graft locked into place. So it's spanning the joint, has to heal up now into the bone above, has to heal into the bone below. Blood vessels will grow into it, nerves will grow into it and the whole process as I said is, is quite um, prolonged. So our registry is pretty reassuring and the good news is that most individuals are going to get back into play as we hope um, in the region of 85% and that would be uh, in keeping with lots of other studies um, that have performed around the world and in fact better than, than, than some. Now re-injury is an important topic because that can be devastating and um, not just for that individual in the short term um, but also can unfortunately be the end for some people in terms of their sporting involvements. Although we can often do another ACL reconstruction, what's called a revision, um, uh, it's not necessarily always easy and the results are not going to be as good. Some individuals though will get back into it. David Pocock re-injured his um, knee um, after his ACL reconstruction very early, I think in his first game back, and then got back into it again. So he was out for the best part of two years, two and a half years. You know, anything can happen in a tangle like this on a GA pitch. You can be good for a year, you can be good for two years, you can be good for five years. 
and then something like this happens and you can reach her. And then some things are just unlucky, like a, a recent Munster player who just landed awkwardly, I believe, in the line out and re-injured in his second game back. So it's a particular concern in our younger age groups and cohorts. And many studies have looked at this, um, such as this one here, demonstrating that patients under 25 may have a secondary injury rate of at least 23%. And if you look at these, this is an Australian group who've looked at their results. And in particular, men under 18 in their cohort had a very high re-injury rate in sport over the first few years, about 28%. And that's on the same side. If you add in an injury to the other knee, which again, unfortunately, can sometimes happen, overall, at least a third of individuals have a re-injury, which um, is worrying me high. Long-term consequences um, are important just to counsel individuals on because what we're giving people is not a normal knee. The cruise ship we're putting in is not as good as nature intended. It's usually good enough, gives a good function and outcome, um, but there are still potential problems down the line, and that's that of arthritis. Um, these individuals, even 20 years later, are still quite young and active, and it can have a significant implication when we're starting to see bone-on-bone -bone type arthritis developing at a young age. And I would have done several uh, knee replacements just in the last few months on men generally in their 50s who may have had a crucial ligament in their 20s. And these studies back that up. Um, if you look at individuals maybe 20 years after they've had an ACL injury and reconstruction and you x-ray them, you'll see at least 40% are showing signs of early arthritis and about a quarter of them are getting symptoms. And looking at how common it is to get knee replacements, if you look at 15-year um, results, uh, about 1% of people, unfortunately, have already had a knee replacement against uninjured group, um, which would be much lower. So ideally, clearly, um, it would be nice if we can prevent ACL injuries. Um, now, it's never going to be zero because of the unpredictability of contact sports. Uh, but there are studies that have been done and programs that have been instigated that show that we can actually reduce the injury rates, particularly in our younger athletes and younger female athletes, by some circumstances and studies up to 50%, which is clearly very significant. Um, unfortunately, it's quite difficult to get buy-in sometimes for these study, for these types of programs, and there, that would be another talk in itself. Um, but they are out there, and they can um, um, they can be effective. And these are mostly going to target things that our strength and conditioning and physiotherapy team um, will talk about: um, improving strength, improving movement patterns, in particular, called essentially what's called neuromuscular training. Um, two big studies here demonstrating, as we've talked about, um, this study looking at 18 different um, interventions showing a reduction um, from 1 in 54 to 1 in 111 with that, one of those programs in place. And this is a big study looking at thousands of individuals, and that's in young females. And then there is a good program called the FIFA 11 Plus program. Um, which again has shown significant reduction in injury rates. So, and this isn't just cruciates, this is also hamstring tears, it's groin problems, it's ankle injuries, um, if it's instigated into a, a training schedule. So if you're interested in that, it's um, fairly straightforward. You can just Google FIFA 11 Plus and you can download these PDF and manuals um, and printable sheets on all the exercises. Um, and uh, they're very good explanations, little video clips and diagrams of, of how that can be incorporated into a, a club's um, um, training program a couple of times a week at least. Um, and it's offering a very good warm up um, because it does seem sometimes that injuries can happen earlier in games, which is a bit counterintuitive because you think you might get tired and get injured. But a lot of these injuries can also happen quite early in the games. And if you get a good warm up done, uh, which isn't just a simple couple of stretches, um, um, it would be useful, I think, to, to, to look around if you have children and things in clubs, whether they can introduce that into their, into their team. So just finally, if you take home points, um, this is a common uh, knee injury. A third of our patients, unfortunately, are young and under 21, and they'll tend to offer an ACL reconstruction to 
these individuals who are demanding, wanting to get back into these sports, to try and give a knee that's more robust, um, give them more stability and allow them to return into the sports they love. Hopefully also going to be able to produce, uh, reduce further damage. And the majority will get the outcome we want with a stable knee and get back into activity. The surgery though has to be individually based and uh, that's the decision and the discussion that I'll have with uh, uh, the individuals um, in the consulting rooms. And I think it's imp important that everyone needs to appreciate and understand, and this is um, important for the patients and it's important for parents of, uh, of individuals who have injured their knees, um, important for physiotherapists and important for GPs to appreciate that um, prevention programs that exist do seem to work and probably are underutilized, that we do perhaps underplay a little bit the prognostic implications of ACL tears and um, because of the increased risk of osteoarthritis and we also always need to counsel and I'll tell our younger individuals that this can be a problem that secondary injury rates either to the same knee or the other knee um, um, can be quite high so all around a fairly significant injury which we have good um, procedures for but um, there are issues that need appreciating and understanding. Um, now, hopefully that wasn't uh, um, too difficult to take on board, and I hope there are a few points that people have taken home. Um, that's it. Many thanks. Thank you.